<laughs> what could possibly go wrong? It's fine. Tunnel going. Is the dark tunnel going straight down? They avoided really good. It's not going straight down. Is it really a rep ride? It's like a roller coaster. It's kind of like the Matterhorn. They're going on a mic. They just need that. You really got to do that. You have to define scary. Right. You're going to get wet. showed on the surface and it had the gold right there in it. It wasn't until 1904 though they started mining it year round. In 1904 they built a three-story boarding house on the top of this mountain. It still stands today and is hanging off the cliffs. It is quite a sight. After the tour, once we're outside, it asked me there's a certain place you can walk and stand and see that boarding house and gift shop love it. Now after they built that boarding house, they mined their mine year round for about 15 years and made a little bit of money. After that, this mine just never really made money again. There are seven levels to this mine. The boarding house level is the top level, the seventh. You were standing on the very bottom level now. This level is driven in here in the 60s by a company called Dixieland Oil Corporation. This level cost six million dollars and they never found one ounce of paying rock. It was a complete loss. <laughs> this was the vein they were mining. This is the old 100 vein. Same vein that they mined in 1904 where they were mining gold 3,000 feet above us. But at this elevation, if there was anything in this vein, it'd be in that white quartz. That's where your gold, silver, lead, copper zinc is going to be. The shiny stuff you are seeing is fool's gold, also known as iron pyrite. It has about 40% iron in it and is not very valuable. Now on this tour, I'm going to show you how we mine this vein by drilling, blasting, cleaning the rock up and hauling it out. This is called a cycle. Miners work in pairs. Each pair of miners is expected to do one cycle per shift. So I'm going to show you what one shift of hard rock mining is. Does anyone have any questions? All right, you guys follow me this way. <laughs> you got on your feet. Tennis shoes? Now this rock is incredibly hard. You can swing a pick against the rock all you want and you will break the pick before you ever break the rock. You can even take a stick of dynamite, duct tape it against the rock, detonate it, come back in, nothing will have happened. There will just be a big black powder burn where the dynamite blew up at. The only way you can break this rock is by drilling a pattern of holes to put the dynamite in. This is the first method of drilling holes was hand stealing, single jacking and double jacking. Single jacking means one miner, smaller hammer, smaller steel. Double jacking means two miners, bigger hammer, bigger steel. Now the way double jacking works is one miner swings the hammer, the other one holds the steel. After each hit, the one holding the steel turns it a quarter turn. This will keep the steel from hanging up inside the rock and it makes a more circular hole to load the explosives into. Now the entire seventh level of this mine was hand steeled out by these methods. It was also done under candlelight. 
That was the only source of light they had on the ground in 1904. So with one candle lit, it gave off enough light where you could see a shine at the top yeah. of the steel where you've been hitting it. Yeah. That's about all you could see in here. Now you, our shifts are 10 hours long and you are paid $3 a day for doing this. If you stayed in that boarding house, they took $2 of your pay for room and board. So you really only made a dollar a day. Now in 1918, they started coming out with some of the first air power drills to replace hand stealing. This is one of them here. It's called the column drill. It weighs 450 pounds, sits on a column pinched between the roof and the floor. The arm the drill is mounted on can be moved up and down and swivel, so you can drill whatever pattern of holes you need to in the rock to place your explosives. Now the first air drills being air only put a lot of rock dust in the air. Myers breathed that rock dust in, turns along the rock pretty much. It's called silicosis. Life expectancy of a hard rock miner in 1918 was about 28 to 30 years old. Some years later, they came out with a hollowed out drill steel. The hollowed out drill steel shoots water down the center, comes out the drill bit on the end. Cools the bit and allows it to drill a little bit faster, but more than anything, it took the rock dust completely out of the air. It is still done this way today in modern mining. Now I'm gonna run this drill for just a minute to show you folks how loud it is. It is loud, you might wanna cover your ears. There we go, folks. <laughs> now, if we were actually mining, this drill would take two miners to operate. It will drill an inch and a half diameter hole six feet deep in 20 minutes. Double jacking was a two foot deep hole in two hours. So these really start changing the mining yeah. industry. In 1950, they came out with this drill here. This is called a jack lake. It is air powered again, but instead of a big heavy column that it sits on, it has a pneumatic leg. This leg is full of air and it pushes the drill head into the rock for you. The entire thing weighs 120 pounds. Once you get it set up and drilling, it's kind of like riding a bicycle. If you can find the balance point to the drill, you can literally run it with two fingers, even though it is 120 pounds. Now I'm gonna run this one for a minute. Again, it's loud, you might want to cover your ears. starts to fill full of air and starts to push the drill head into the rock. The jack leg will drill an inch and a half diameter hole six feet deep in three minutes, so it is very fast. They still use the jack leg today in modern mining. Uh, say a miner's work in pairs, each miner runs his own jack leg, so there's always two jack legs being ran in the same tunnel at the same time. Does anyone have any questions? No questions? <laughs> is it still? Oh, so they get paid today. Oh, is it still? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so today, like a, like a modern miner doing this kind of mining, this is small narrow vein mining is what this is called. And running a jack leg, anywhere from 50 to $60 an hour. Um, you know, as a miner nowadays, you're 100,000 a year easily. So you What's can that? be more than that if you're willing to travel and if you're willing to live in man camps in like Mexico and Indonesia and stuff like that, you can even make more. What's the life expectancy now? Well, you can be a miner and and make this a career and retire from it. And if you start right out of high school, you'll be retired, I mean, by the time you're 40. You make money in this fast, and the retirement is really high in mining, too. But there are a couple other things. If you do make it a career, a 20-year career, um, you have about a 98% chance you're going to lose one of your fingers. There's, it's just going to happen. There's too many things in here that grab your finger. And you have about a 99.9% .9 chance you're going to end up divorced, too. Yeah, we're going to say <laughs> You spend so much time in here that Mrs. doesn't like that. Yeah. Do you guys wear respirators now? Nope. No. So it's all still, there's no water hooked up to these because there's no drill bits on them. That's been the same hole for 27 years. <laughs> if we actually drill well, holes right, in here, right, you'd have to move some, your tour. <laughs> what's that? You'd have to move your tour. Yeah, this would look like Swiss cheese in here. So since we're not drilling, we don't actually pump water. Right. Is it still 10-hour days? Or? Yep, 10-hour days. Some mines are 12-hour days. Wow. Last mine I worked in was 12-hour shifts. And where was that? In your rib. So I worked at the Revenue for six years over there. Yeah. Any other questions? Are you going to show us the dynamite? <laughs> yeah. now, I'm going to display ahead. So, on the tour, I'm showing you the cycle of drilling, blasting, and mucking. So, 
I got a couple other things I'll show you, and then the dynamite, and then I'll show you how to clean the rock up at the very end of the tour. There's still a lot of mining operations. Y'all can squeeze in here a little bit at this spot. straight up and down. They put these in for a couple of different reasons. One is, is hot air rises. So the air on this level is going to rise up this raise, outcast the level above. Now the mine naturally circulates ventilation, and we don't have that fans pumping air in here so we can breathe. Another reason we put these in, <coughs> excuse me, is if you're mining several different levels of this mine at the same time, and it's wintertime outside, it's a lot easier to maintain the snow removal of one, entr one entrance of the mine than all those entrances. So if we're a group of miners, we come in this level in the morning, get inside this cage, which we call a skip, and we ride it to whatever level we're going to work. Now the way this worked is a big electric hoist set back here, and someone operated that hoist. Cables off that hoist went the whole way up the raise through a bull wheel, came back down, and connected to this cage here. This bell right here set next to the hoist operator back here. A rope connected to this bell ran the whole way up and down the raise. So while you're inside that cage, at any point, you can stick your hand out, grab that rope. Through a series of bell signals, you can tell that hoistman to stop, go, or whatever level you want to go to. Let's see. You want to ring the bell? Pull a couple times, real fast. Pull it hard, max. There you go. There you go. They still use the bell today in modern hard rock mining. You cannot use radios in here. If you had radios, you would have to have an antenna at every place the tunnel changes direction. Then when you blast, a lot of times the shockwave and the blast will knock out the radio signal. Now another way to get from one level to the next is called the coffin skip. Big enough for one miner and his drill to fit in, and it looks like a coffin. These are outlawed and not allowed to be used in hard rock mining anymore. For a while, they're the leading cause of death in hard rock mines, and it's from miners falling out of these things. This is not wild, but to give you an idea what it's like to ride in one, Let it fall out. You can imagine 650 feet long of the coffin skills. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions? Bouncing around. So how many miners at a time would be working in a mine of this size? Um, this is a very small mine. This would be probably 30 miners a shift maybe. And then there'd be a night shift with 30 miners on it. So, I mean, and that's if we're mining like three levels at once. Um, if we were to mine just this level, this would be like a crew of like probably eight or nine people, and that's it. And so the last mine you worked at, how many miners were there? So that was, uh, that was, that had a hundred, 160 miners working there. It was a lot bigger mine than this. Um, the train ride in, just to where we got to our working area, was two hours one way. So wow. was that it was, part of the ship? Yep. So in hard rock mine, you get paid portal to portal. In a lot of coal mines, I worked in the coal mines for a while too, you get paid face to face. The face is where you're advancing your tunnel. And in the coal mine, it was the same kind of commute. It was about an hour and a half one way. That's on your own time. So I mean, we're always racing. You know? um, and then I was driving raises like this. I was driving these raises from the bottom up. And uh, there's a thing called an Alamac race climber. And it's like roller coaster rail you pull to the rocks, and then it's air power. If you and your partner get in this basket, and you ride up the race, and it's, it's a cog system. It choo -choo 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 climbs up the cogs off of an air motor. And it carries your dynamite drills, all your tools. And once you get to the top, you get out on the deck, you drill your round, load it with explosives, come back down, shoot it, do it all over again. It was about a two-hour ride up in the climber. So I had like an hour and 45 minutes and two hours back to the climber sometimes, and then two hours up the climber before I even started work. 
Wow. How many feet would that be? What's that? How many feet would that be one way? Um, and how many feet like in? Yeah, and travel, out? distance travel. So, well, with ours, we didn't have like such a straight shot on our rail. We had a lot of corners and uh, turnarounds and stuff in there. And I think, I mean, I think that it was like 16,000 feet or something like that of rail that we had to go through. But we had to switch things out and do all this stuff to get back there. And then the climber was about 800 feet up. Uh, so. what, do you, what do you do during your commute? What's that? What do you do during your commute? <coughs> Sleep. <laughs> <laughs> Even in the climber. I would wedge the, so when you get in the climber, and the climber is really hard to explain. After the tour, if you remind me, I will forget between now and then. But in the gift shop, there is a photo of an Alamac Ray's climber. And if you remind me, I'll show you. But in the climber, you put all your dynamite inside the basket with you, so you have a seat to sit on. And so you, if you build it right, you know, you can wedge the throttle of the climber and have a nice, like, sleep on the way up. So that's what I would do. So how, so how much mining can a place like this handle before it loses its structural integrity? Oh, a lot. A lot. This, like, the best way to explain this is, is uh, think of a snowbank, like waist high. Have you, are you around snow at yeah, all or yeah. been around it? So take a pencil and poke seven holes in that snowbank in a line. That will represent this mine versus okay. the mountain. That's okay. snow and it won't even cave yeah. in, you know. We have another thing called stoping. So right here where you guys are walking is where the vein was. That vein is still above us. Veins run vertical inside of a mountain. Hole is horizontal in the seam. Okay. You can't see that vein right here because it's it, oxygen's been hitting this for 60 years. It's oxidized over. But sometimes when you're mining along, you'll hit a spot in that vein where there's good metals in it. And then you do a thing called stoping. The best way to explain stoping is think of an ant farm. Okay. And you're going to go up and you're going to mine vertically up as much of that ground as you can. And that's another good way to explain it. If you've ever seen like a good ant yeah. farm where yeah. they mined it all Geniuses. out, it doesn't cave in. Yeah. So we essentially do the same thing inside the mountain vertically for our metals yeah. too. So the episodes of Bonanza and Little House are not that accurate. No. <laughs> Little House. Big Little House. <laughs> 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 he, he was born oh, in the hole. That's it. That's it. Get yeah, the car. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they're just so, in the show. I'm not familiar with that. Uh, the one thing I can say though is like, for instance, uh, the chili accident that happened. Yeah. Yeah. When you are in a mine, you do do a lot of precautions and you do pay attention to the ground. The ground tells you everything. Okay. And even when you're mining, you watch the matrix on the sides of it. And they'll tell you sometimes 10 feet before something's gonna happen, like you're gonna hit bad mud inside the mine or something like that. And uh, in that, that, uh, that whole mining accident down there, they ignored a lot of those precautions and they could have avoided that whole problem. Okay. One of the things that they ignored is when you do get in bad ground and you're like questioning it, as you take a big mirror and you'll glue that mirror from like the wall to the ceiling, a great big mirror. And so you watch the mirror, you just take a look at the mirror every day. If you come in one day and that mirror is laying on the ground broken, the ground is moving. That happened four or five hours before that cave in in that mine. Okay. They could evacuate that whole mine. So, so that was all preventable. Happening. It was. I mean, so profit motive. The mine that I worked in that closed four years ago, um, over in Uray, two guys died from carbon monoxide poisoning, and that was a preventable thing too. I mean, they they could have stopped that from happening. Most mine accidents is is that someone got negligent or overlooked something or just thought it was no big deal and that's when you enjoy an accident. You learn how big a deal it is. Yep, exactly. And then it just snowballs. Saved a lot of lives. So, when you were talking about your coal mining with the long commutes and then not your shift your shift when you were face to face was that one? Yeah, so no in the coal mine I, I was on the uh, what did they call that? They had some word for it. We worked a weekend shift
Now this here is all the light you would have in here in the 1800s and early 1900s. It's one candle. You can hang it off your hard hat, pound it in a crack in the rock somewhere, but it is very drippy and wet. This would go out a lot. It is a different kind of dark in here than most people have ever experienced. There's no stars. There's no moon. You literally cannot see your hand this close in front of your face in here. It is pitch black. In 1920, they came out with a carbide light. Carbide goes in the bottom. Water goes in the top. The water slowly drips on the carbine and creates a settling gas that you can ignite. Puts out about a four to six inch flame, lasts five to six hours till you have to refill it. All the dripping water we drove through on the way in, these carbide lights will stay lit through water like that. In 1960, they came out with a red wheat battery powered cap lamp hanging here with the 10 pound battery on the belt. Yeah. That was used till 2001 when they finally came out with the self contained LED lights. In a working mine, there are no electric lights. Every miner has a light on his hard hat. That is all the light you have underground. We used to not have electric lights in this mine tour, and we used to give every single one of you a light on your hard hat, and every single one of you would hold that light on the guide's face while he was talking. <laughs> <laughs> we, we took your guys' lights away pretty quick. That's great. <laughs> now, I need a couple of you to do this. I only want you to do it if you're actually going to give me a guess. I need about five or six of you. Why don't you pick this rock up and try to guess how much it weighs? Ben? Yeah. Don't be scared of the rock. Ray? Anybody work in the maternity ward? <laughs> now pick it straight up. Don't pull it off the table. It's going to break your foot if you drop it on it. There you go. How much is that weigh? 40. 40? It is 22 pounds on the dock. Oh. It is deceivingly heavy for two reasons. One is its size versus its weight, and it's because there's two metals in this rock. And I'll get to those two metals in just a second. The other reason it's deceivingly heavy is your equilibrium is all out of whack right now. Your equilibrium is inside your head. is what gives you your balance, helps you with your depth perception, and it can make weights feel deceivingly heavier than they really are. The reason your equilibrium is out of balance is because there's barometric pressure inside of a mine, and you are not used to it yet. Does anyone feel that in your head, like a, like a head cold, that pressure? That's the barometric pressure. It takes about an hour or two to balance out. You hung out in here for two hours, came back, picked this rock up, you would realize it's not as heavy as it felt before. Now, the other reason it's deceivingly heavy is those two metals. Can anyone guess what the two metals are in this rock? What's some heavy metals? Lead. Lead is one of them. No. The other one I bet someone's wearing right now. Silver. Gold. Yeah, it wouldn't be gold. If it was gold, I would have stolen a long time. <laughs> it is silver. It is silver. This rock is lead and silver and sulfites. Lead, silver, and sulfites mixed together make galena. That's what this piece of ore here is called. You're standing in Galena Mountain. That's the name of this mountain. Unfortunately, this did not come from this mountain. If it did, we'd still be mining this mine. This is about 90% silver. The mine this came from had 100 ounces per ton silver. So meaning every one ton ore car leaving the mine, there's 100 ounces of silver in it. That is a very rich silver mine. There's just a lot of clean in this area. Um, well, I mean, there is some in this mountain. And in in the 19, early 1900s, and they're mining the upper mine, or the upper level of this mine, they had good free gold in there, they had good free silver in there. And I mean, that was probably the air when the mountain was getting gained. And so, I mean, they were probably mining really good silver at that point. I don't know what the assays were in the early 1900s, but I do know for 15 years they did make good mining. And then after that, it just was never there. What do you the call this basic ore here, or this basic rock? So it is a kind of granite. There are 12 kinds of granite. 
I can never remember the name exactly, and even if I can remember the name, I can't pronounce it. It's like a prescription drug, so <laughs> yeah, I'm just going to call it one of the 12 granites. <laughs> now, I'll, uh, this lady had a question about like why it was named Galena Mountain, and that didn't come from here, and the mine didn't do very well. And I'll explain this real quick, and then we'll move on. So when these veins are forming, it is called geothermal replacement. When this was all volcanic, cracks in this rock would allow water and moisture to seep down through those cracks. Hit the magma beneath us, turn into steam, come back up through those cracks. That steam carried the gold, silver, lead, copper, zinc with it. When it gets to a high enough elevation, it pretty much frees in place, trapping those metals. That is the white quartz is the steam, and it would have the metals in it. Now the reason there was nothing at this elevation is when this was all volcanic, it was still too hot at this elevation. It did freeze a vein, but it froze it very slow, and metals are heavy. So the heavy metals worked their way down as it was freezing. The reason 3,000 feet above us there was good gold and silver up there is it froze fast, trapping those metals in place. And it's called geothermal replacement. Does that sum that up a little bit better? Okay. Now this here, folks, is what it looks like after it's been drilled out and loaded. And if we were to detonate this, this would break six feet wide, eight feet tall, and six feet deep. Put out 10 tons of broken rock, so 20,000 pounds. Now, <clears throat> every single hole is drilled six feet deep and loaded to the surface with dynamite, except for this hole here. We leave it empty and we do it on purpose. Does anyone know why we leave the center hole empty? What's that? Kind of. It's explosion. Point for it to blast out. Yep. You need as far expansion. The rock has to be able to break to something. Now dynamite blasts the least resistant path possible. If we load this hole full of dynamite, then all the dynamite is going to shoot right back out the holes we loaded in. This is called rifling your round. By leaving this hole empty, we made that the weak or the the least resistant path possible. Now we can't shoot all this dynamite at once at the same time to that tiny little hole. We have to make this hole bigger and bigger and bigger, and we do that by time delaying our explosives. So what we do is we shoot these two first. These are called your aughts, meaning instant. Then we shoot these two next. These are called your ones, meaning one millisecond of the way, so it does go very fast. Then we shoot twos, threes, fours, fives, so forth and so forth, all one millisecond apart. So what we're doing, folks, is starting with this empty drill hole, and in one millisecond delays, we're blowing that rock inward to that hole, bigger and bigger and bigger, till it has reached the perimeter of what we have drilled and loaded. Now, the very last ones that go off are on the ground. They're called your lifters. There's usually four or five of them, and they are drilled in at a slight downhill angle, and they all go off at the same time. After all this is detonated, you've got a big pile of broken rock sitting here, those lifters go off, and they lift that 10 tons of broken rock up, throw it out here where you folks are standing. It makes it a lot easier to clean up that way. Miners can be very precise with these explosives. Miners can be so good with the lifters that when you come back in after shooting and that 10 tons of broken rock sit in here, it'll look like a dump truck dumped it. That's how precise they can be with them. Now, of course, we get our timing through our electric blasting caps. If the cap is marked zero, that means it's an aught, it's an instant cap, where it's marked one, two, three, four, for however many milliseconds delay the cap is. Every mine I've ever worked in, I've never seen a number 13 blasting cap. Miners are superstitious. We do not believe in the number 13. There's no number 13 on the dog tag board outside, no number 13 or a car. We are not the only ones that believe in this. Next time you're in an elevator, look at the buttons. There's usually not 13th floor if it's a skyscraper. So every single hole here, <clears throat> the first stick of dynamite going in gets the cap, the electric cap with it. You use a wooden pamping rod, never steel, we don't want to create a spark. And we shove that stick of dynamite with the cap all the way back. The cap would be facing back out the hole like this with the wires hanging out of the hole. So everything is loaded, we tie all the wires in to this yellow trunk line here. We roll the yellow trunk line out to a safe distance. As soon as we push the plunger down the box, this is going to detonate. A safe distance is back of the train where we unload it. That's far enough back, and it's because if there is any fly rock from this at all, it will not hit us because a corner separates us. Now, this is not a dead-end tunnel. We have a tunnel going this way. But let's pretend this is a dead-end tunnel. While we're standing back of the train detonating this, we have to keep our mouths open. Does anyone know why? You said it earlier. Pressure. pressure. Dynamite's going to put off a lot of pressure. That pressure has nowhere to go except right back down that tunnel towards you. That amount of pressure can blow out your eardrums. With your mouth open, your head has a way of releasing that pressure and equalizing. 
You want to pull that up and push it down, string bean? <laughs> you know, fire in the hole and then push it down. No fire in the hole? <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about this? So oh, what time period does it take for all of them to go up? Oh, it's fast. I mean, milliseconds are really fast. I mean, when we're standing back at the train, you can't hear the individual holes. You're going to kind of hear a boom, boom, and then there'll be a little bit of a pause, and then when the lifters go off, you'll hear a boom, and that's that's about all you're going to hear. As so no seconds. Yeah, I mean it's 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 real fast. I mean you get into like rounds where you're shooting like three thousand holes, then it's like you know standing down there, and it's like everything starts rumbling and it goes on and on and on for a while. But is that kind of fun? Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I mean, any kid that ever shot a potato gun knows how fun that is. So yeah, I mean, you know it is, but at the same time, it's like, you know, a lot of people like it when it's loud and stuff. When when this is working right, it's not very loud. Right, but it's rumbling. It, yeah, it's rumbling, but the noise is very muffled because it's actually breaking rock. If we're standing down there and it's loud, we did something horribly wrong. And all the dynamite shooting right back out the holes and detonating in the air is what's happening. So, I mean, it can be fun. Some guys take it a little far, and they will. Uh, the next thing I'm going to show you is a mucking machine. They weigh about 1,500 pounds. It would be only right back there where the back of this group of people is. It'd be sitting on the track right there waiting to clean this up. I have seen guys hide behind that when they are shooting. I mean, they're only 100 feet away, and then they'll come around the corner afterwards, and earwax is out of their ears, and snot's hanging out there. That was a good one, you know? Man, your cheese has slid off your cracker. You're insane. <laughs> Hard Rock Mining. 
Now, in 1938, they came out with this piece of equipment here. This is called a mucking machine. It weighs 1,500 pounds, drives on track, and powered by air. From 1938 till now, 2019, no technology has ever been able to replace the mucker inside a track mine like this. It is so efficient. A good miner operating this could load that one ton car in about 30 seconds, and that's 2,000 pounds of rock. It is one of the more dangerous pieces of equipment to run in the hard rock mine. You'll kind of see why I'm going to run it. It is long like the drills, though. Mine long. Cover your ears. Cover your ears. There we go. side of the track. Now I'm not riding it, I'm just bleeding it off. The reason these things are so dangerous is you drive into the rock pile with your bucket up in the air, you drive these wheels up on a rock, tip it over against yourself, pinch yourself between the rock wall and the mucker. A lot of miners do that, it breaks a lot of their ribs. The other common accident is you accidentally leave the air on, you forget about it, you have your hands up here, or you reach in here to grab a rock and throw it out. Bump the control, the longer arm comes back. This is notorious for taking fingers. At the beginning of the tour, we were talking about miners losing fingers. I've seen about three miners lose fingers from these things. The good thing in hard rock mining, though, is if you lose a finger, a lot of times the mine will reimburse you by the knuckle. So if you lost a pinky all the way down to your hand, well, that might be like a new Duramax diesel there. So not the worst thing. <laughs> Does anyone have any questions about the mucker? Alright. <laughs> One last thing on the tour, guys. You guys can come down here a little ways. You gotta come see this. That's one of the most important things in here. Now this here is called the hunting wagon. The miners are underground fortified. There are one of these on every level, and it goes in an abandoned part of the level. And some sort of light stays next to it, and it stays lit. So if you come around the corner, see light, it means the hunting wagon's open for use. Once you start using it, you turn that light off and your cap lamp. You're in the pitch black. Got a little bit of privacy now. Now folks, we came uphill on the way in. We are four feet higher right here than we were outside the gift shop. We always mine uphill on the way in. The reason being, we don't want the water to run out of this mine naturally. We do not want to have to pump it. We also want loaded ore cars going downhill on the way out, not uphill. So to keep the honey wagon from just rolling outside on its own, we put a piece of chain over the track. It's called the chalk. The wheel hits the chain, honey wagon can't roll. Now a very famous term came from the honey wagon, and it's a term that is still used today. Has anyone ever heard the term, don't yank my chain? Yeah. Ever heard that? That came from memes. Miners like playing jokes on one another. Some miners using it, you don't like them, sneak up on them in the dark, yank that chain, and give them a good push. That's where don't yank my chain came from. <laughs> anyone have any questions? Brilliant. Brilliant. So, no one? What's that? You know, in this mine, this water is incredibly clean. And it is, it's got like the right mineral balance and everything. But I'm not going to guarantee you that there's not a dead elk on the top of this mountain that that bacteria got in this water. Um, that is an indicator it's a very, very poor mine. And the reason behind it is, is if you've got a good mine, a good gold, silver, lead, copper, zinc, you have a lot of high iron usually with that. When you mine in here, you added oxygen to it. You got iron, you got water, you pretty much got the, the basics of sulfuric acid starting here. Now, if this was a good mine, that ditch would be orange, you could have a pH level of one. Take this shovel, stick it in the ditch, come back about a week later, all that would be left of the shovel is the wood. It'd eat the metal away that fast. I've seen mines that were so, so good on gold and everything, but had <coughs> such acidic water that the track, it would beat through the track in a matter of a month or two and they actually put oak rail in the bad drippy spots just so that they wouldn't have to keep replacing the track. And uh, that's the big indicator of why mining 
has really been shut down in Colorado because we're at the top. We're at the top of a lot of these rivers, so you can't pollute that water before it's even gotten to these millions of people downstream. Now, if we're on the bottom of the river, no one would probably care. But being at the top of the river is yeah. challenging. You got to put in 20, 30 million dollar water treatment plant. Then you got to have you know a hundred, two hundred million dollar reclamation pond to turn the ground back to its pristine. Um, how it was before you started mining. So it's like before you even start mining, you know, you're in this $250 million and you haven't even gotten a penny out of the mine yet. So it makes it very difficult. Gold needs to be, we are just talking about this with the, the owner of the mine cure out there. Gold needs to be about $3,000 an ounce to make this kind of mining profitable. Good time, kids. 